a day that will be. And that's exactly what we're praying about this morning. We're praying for the second coming. Scripture assures us that it will happen. Jesus is coming again. But we don't know the time or the hour. And I often look at the sky, at the different formations of the clouds, and I wonder just what kind of clouds Jesus will come through when he bursts through with a shout and with a heavenly host. I may not know the time or the hour. I may not know what kind of clouds he'll come through. But I know that I'm looking forward to his coming with great anticipation. And I invite those of you who are also eagerly awaiting the return of our sweet Jesus to join me here at the front as we pray this morning. As you come forward, I'm going to read from John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Please join me as we kneel. Dear Lord, we long to see you. We pray that your second coming will be soon. We want to see you as we worship you. We want to be with you forever. We have questions we want to ask you, but they may melt away in your presence as we simply say thank you. We love you. Dear Lord, we have loved ones who are resting, waiting for you to call them to eternal life, whole and healthy again. We're challenged by trials of every kind, sickness, temptation, grief, financial stress, strained relationships. Lord, you know the turmoil of our hearts. We thank you for giving us your peace, your precious promises, and the power to endure. But we look forward to your return where these old things will pass away and you will make everything new and perfect. Lord, help us to watch, pray, and be ready for your coming. Grow your love in us so big that it spills out to those around us, giving them hope too. Help us to be bold and let others know about you so they can also look forward to your second coming. So, dear Father, we simply pray, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. This is irregular, but Rachel and the praise team, um, can I put you on the spot? When I'm done preaching, can you come back up and sing the, um, what a day that'll be, that song. Okay. <laughs> I didn't go over this at the beginning, but I was listening to it and it fits perfectly, so throw caution to the wind. Uh, so I'll tell you when to come up at the, at the end. Uh, my wife and I have a lot in common. We both don't like being put on the spot, um, but uh, we definitely have some differences between the two of us. Uh, for example, uh, Rachel loves country decor, especially bears. Bears, 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 everywhere on everything. Uh, when we were still dating, she kept trying to sneak bear-related paraphernalia into my apartments. So a uh, bear dish towel here and a bear blanket there. Uh, I, on the other hand, prefer bear decorations, spelled B-A-R-E. Um, maybe don't think hospital room, but maybe hospital lobby. Um, what else? I read instructions before playing a game or building furniture. She likes to learn as she goes. Um, I toss and turn for like 30 minutes before I can fall asleep. She just, and then she's out in like a minute. Um, she is more in touch with her emotions. I'm logical. She 
loves camping. I am logical. <laughs> um, but one of the biggest differences between us is the types of movies that we like. Now, it doesn't matter quite so much the genre of the movie, but what really does matter is how a movie ends. You see, I like movies that are open-ended, and they leave you thinking about what you just saw. She likes movies where everything is tied up in a neat little bow. Her ideal movie ends with everybody, usually a couple, happily together skipping along a beach at sunset. I prefer depressing movies where everyone is dead at the end. <laughs> Now, that's not a rule for every movie. I mean, I don't need the end of Finding Nemo to be a sushi roll, but in general, the way that Rachel and I like a movie to end is very different. Why? Because both she and I agree it matters how it ends. It matters how it ends. The movie might be amazing, but then it has a really lousy ending and it kind of ruins the whole thing. Or the movie might have been pretty lousy, but if it has a really good ending, you walk away feeling good. It matters how it ends. Well, the same is true of the Bible. It matters how it ends. We've spent the past few weeks talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus, and Jesus dies on the cross, and that is not the end of the story, is it? He deals a death blow to the grave by rising again. But even that is not the end of the story. After his resurrection, Jesus makes a few appearances to his followers, but eventually he has to leave them. This is from Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Notice they still think Jesus is going to be Israel's Messiah here. They think he's going to come and set up an earthly kingdom. So they've still got a few things to learn. Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, and all Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is going to leave, yet he's still going to be with his followers. The Holy Spirit will come into their lives. And from now on, God will not just dwell with his people, he will dwell in his people. After Jesus had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. I mean, just... Picture this moment for a second here. It was weird enough that Jesus died and then came back to life, and now he just floated off into the sky. Why? What's going on here? Two men dressed in white suddenly stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will what? Will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So these two men, angels it would seem, promise that Jesus is not going to be gone forever. He will come back at some point. You know, many people expected a Messiah that would come once. Jesus is a Messiah that will come twice. And this is what we're going to be talking about for the next three weeks, actually. Uh, the good news of the Bible is not just that Jesus came. The good news is also that Jesus is coming back. And this might be the best news of all. You know, ever since the Enlightenment, the Western world has believed in human progress as a solution to everything that is wrong in the world. We call this belief humanism. So as science and culture develop more and more, we're able to decrease violence and warfare and poverty and increase the quality of life. The future looks bright because we humans have the resources to bring it about. Now, this humanist view of progress doesn't need God. Why? Because we are in control of the storyline. With enough reason and technology, we can evolve into a utopian society. Well, as the 20th century went along, many people abandoned this humanist philosophy as they saw the atrocities of World War II 
play out, atrocities that originated in some of the most advanced civilizations of the world. Lord David Cecil said this, the jargon of the philosophy of progress taught us to think that the savage and primitive state of man is behind us. But barbarism is not behind us, it is where? It is within us. He's right, the problem is not external, the problem is internal. Education and politics and science cannot fix what has gone wrong in the human heart. Now, even though this human view of progress fell out of fashion in the mid-20th century, this humanist view has actually made something of a resurgence lately, even if it's cloaked in a bit of pessimism. Just think about these two statements that you often hear nowadays. I can't believe we're still talking about blank in 2024 or we wanna be on the right side of history. What's behind those two statements? Well, people believe that history is headed somewhere and that it's headed somewhere better. Society is moving onward and upward. Now, Christians and secular humanists can both agree on one thing, and that is that we both believe that history is headed somewhere good. But our reasons for believing that could not be more different. In one view, human progress is the engine that brings justice and righteousness into the world. In the biblical view, the world will be set right once and for all, but not because society is evolving and maturing, but because God is in control of the future and he will one day make all things new. That the hope of the second coming is that divine intervention will soon do what human effort never could. So, let's talk about the return of Jesus, shall we? There are paradigms and pictures of the second coming that I want to share with you today. And my goal is that you can just be filled with hope and joy this morning. So to get started, I'm just gonna put some song lyrics on the screen, and I wanna see if you notice any repeating ideas in these stanzas from well-known songs. We're gonna go through three of them. Away in a manger, bless all the dear children in thy tender care, and take us to, or and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Next one, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. And finally, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Now think about those three stanzas. How do these songs imagine the end of the biblical story? Yeah, one day we will leave this world and be forever in heaven with God. Now, the idea that we will one day be forever with God is true, and it's biblical, but there's also kind of a half-truth floating through these lyrics. You see, most Christians believe that eternity will be spent forever in heaven. A common idea is that we will fly around and sit on clouds, we'll sing in a heavenly choir. I like the way that Huckleberry Finn reacts to this belief. This is Mark Twain. Miss Watson told me all about the bad place, and I said I wished I was there. She got mad. She said it was wicked to say what I said. She said she wouldn't say it for the whole world. She was going to live such as to go to the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was to go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. Well, I could see no advantage in going where she was going, so I made up my mind that I wouldn't try for it. (laughs) Honestly, I don't blame him. That vision of eternity sounds pretty drab. Turns out scripture's vision of life in the age to come is not precious moments, flying around with harps all day. Though the Bible does teach that we first go to heaven when Jesus returns, that's only for a period of time. The real end of the story is when heaven invades earth and purifies it and restores it to its original beauty. Which brings us to the title for our series, the Greek word telos, telos. So this is used throughout the New Testament to talk about the second coming. And the basic translation of this word is end. So the telos is the end. So Jesus, when talking about signs of his return, will say something like, these things must take place, then the telos will come, then the end will come. 
Well, this word can also mean goal or outcome. And I actually think this translation is helpful. You see, when we talk about the end of the world, as Christians, we're actually talking about the goal of the universe. History is headed somewhere. And this world is not just headed for destruction. This world is actually headed for restoration. Just think about some of the phrases that get used to talk about the end of the world in the Bible. Jesus calls the second coming the renewal of all things. Peter says that a time is coming when God will restore everything. Paul writes that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom. And then Peter again summarizes things really well when he says that we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Now let me visualize these two ideas for you. Uh, Most Christians, even some Adventists, have a timeline of world history that looks something like this. In the beginning, God created a perfect world. The fall introduced sin, and now we live in a fallen world. And the gospel hope is that God will one day take us away from this world into our home in heaven. Now, is this an overly simplified picture here? Yes, it is but this is actually a pretty faithful representation of how many think about the telos of all things. Now, there's a number of downsides to this picture right here. We could talk about those some other time. But just for right now, I want to show you a better way to understand what Scripture teaches about the telos of all things. And it goes a little something like this. Some of you have seen me share this before. The Bible is the story of heaven and earth. There is God's space, and there's our space. And at the beginning, there is complete overlap between the two. God can dwell with humanity. He can walk alongside them. But sin ruptures this relationship, and heaven and earth are torn apart. Adam and Eve have to leave the garden, and then the rest of the Bible is God going on a rescue mission. Now notice, God's rescue mission is not to whisk his people away to heaven forever and ever. His goal is to restore this overlap. He is going to make a new earth where God and humanity can dwell together as was always intended. So the telos of all things, the end, the goal, is to get back to where we started. Eternity is not about evacuation. It's about restoration. God will guide history not just to its end, but to a new beginning. See, God has always wanted to dwell with his creation, and the day is coming when he will finally and fully get to be with us. This is actually underlined really well in the book of Revelation, when John talks about the dimensions of the heavenly city that descends to the new earth. John writes, the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. What's the shape of the city? Perfect cube. And some of you are going to recognize that there's something else in your Bible that is shaped to be a perfect cube. What was that? Yeah, it was the most holy place in the temple. This was where God's presence dwelled. And could everyone just go strolling into the most holy place and hang out with God? No. How many people could do that? One person, the high priest, once a year during a special ceremony could go in there. But John anticipates a new earth where we will all live in the most holy place. We will all live in the presence of of God. Heaven and earth will overlap in the way that they were always meant to. So we spend eternity praising God, yes, but also learning and traveling and building and laughing and loving and worshiping and reigning because the story will end as it began, humanity and God reigning over a beautiful creation. You know, I've mentioned before that the Bible is not laid out like an encyclopedia of beliefs or a code book of laws. It's actually laid out start to finish as one grand story, how God has been at work in history to create and then to redeem this world. 
And if we can just be uh, English students for a, a moment. Yes, Teacher Rachel, this is for you. <laughs> is the Bible a tragedy or a comedy? Is the Bible a tragedy or a comedy? Do you remember categorizing plays this way in school? You might be the only one. Okay, so uh, comedy in our mind tends to stir up like humor as an idea, but when you're talking about plays, it really doesn't have to do with the number of jokes. It has to do with how the story ends. So if the ending is happy, then it's a comedy. If the ending is sad, then it's a tragedy, even if that play had a bunch of funny moments and comic relief throughout. Now, the Bible is not just a story. The Bible is the story. It outlines human history from start to finish. And according to the Bible, what kind of story are we living in? Are we in a comedy or a tragedy? Yeah, yeah, we are in a grand cosmic comedy, right? Happily ever after is on the horizon because Jesus died and rose again. You know, it's interesting, in Shakespeare's plays, how many of you liked Shakespeare in high school? Okay, my hand is not up at all. I never understood anything the guy was saying. Um, I, would, I would think that two characters were in love as I was reading it, and then I would go on Spark Notes to translate what I read and find out that those two characters were actually mortal enemies, turns out, or parent and child. Anyways, Shakespeare, not for me. Shakespeare would usually write one of two endings in his play. If it was a comedy, it would end with a wedding, if it was a tragedy, it would end with a death. That's an easy little hack to tell what kind of play you're reading. In Shakespeare's world, stories either end with death or a wedding. And this is interesting because the Bible foresees a happy ending for this world, and it pictures that happy ending as a wedding. This is Revelation chapter 19. Then I heard, John, what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. So the Lamb is who? Jesus, and people are getting ready in this because what's about to happen? There's a wedding about to happen. The lamb is getting married to his bride. His bride. Who is Jesus getting married to? Well, throughout the Bible, God's covenant with his people is described as a marriage. God is married to his people. So throughout the Old Testament, when the people of Israel go after other gods, it's not described as disobedience or breaking a contract. It's described as adultery or infidelity. They have been unfaithful to their covenant marriage relationship with God. And eventually this gets so bad that God divorces his people. We read this in Jeremiah chapter three. Well, in the small book of Hosea, God makes a beautiful promise to his people. Most of the book of Hosea is God accusing his people of unfaithfulness and warning them of the consequences. But tucked inside this book, is a beautiful promise. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. Do you see what God is promising in there? He's promising a remarriage to his people. The people of God are going to be taken to him in marriage once again. But this time, how long will it last? Forever. Forever. Now, Jesus actually doesn't drop this marriage theme. Let me share with you something cool. Just a brief little history lesson for you on Jewish weddings around the time of the New Testament. There was four general steps. Firstly, the guy would go to a father of a girl that he was interested in, and he would ask for her hand in marriage. And if the father agreed, then the couple would be betrothed. Uh, betrothal is similar to engagement, but it's more legally binding than how we think of engagement. Secondly, the guy would then pay a dowry to the girl's father, which was a sum of money. Don't think of it like the girl is getting bought and sold. This was to supplement the bride's household for the loss of her help in the home. 
Thirdly, the groom would go off. Remember, they're not married yet. They're just betrothed. The groom would leave, and he would prepare a home for him and his bride. Usually, this was just extra rooms added onto his father's house. And when he was ready, he would go and get his bride. It was always within a year, but the bride wouldn't know when the groom was coming, so she always had to be ready. Her groom would come and get her. They would be married, and then they would return to his home that he had prepared for them. Now, check this out. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples. Uh, Dana referenced this earlier. This is John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. What kind of language is Jesus using here? He's using marital language. His father's house has many rooms. Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. He'll come back to get us so that we can be with him. When Jesus comes back, there's going to be a wedding. And this is what Revelation envisions. The wedding of the lamb has come. Now notice in here, what is the bride wearing? Bright and clean, fine white linen. All throughout Revelation, white robes are a sign of righteousness and and purity. Now, has the bride of Christ, his followers, have they, have we been entirely faithful to Jesus? No, we, we have not. Yet here the bride stands blameless. Why? Well, it's because Jesus has made her, Jesus has made us pure. And it's not just that we are scrubbed clean of all of our sinfulness. It's also that the righteousness of Jesus gets attributed to us. We get to raid Jesus' closet, so to speak. We are dressed like royalty because we are in Christ. So the return of Jesus, friends, is not a message of doom and destruction and fear. It is a wedding invitation. It'll be the day when we finally get to see the face of the one who loved us and who gave himself for us. Five years ago, this August, Rachel and I got married. Uh, The day was wonderful, of course. It was 85 degrees and outdoors. Perfect day to be wearing a three-piece suit, blarf. Um, A lot of the day is a blur. I remember smiling for eight million photos and trying to sneak in bites of food during the reception and tripping on Rachel's dress during the first dance. Uh, But what I remember most clearly about that day was the first look, first look. This is when the groom gets to see his bride in her wedding dress for the first time. Now, it used to be that this would happen as the bride comes down the aisle, but nowadays many couples choose to take pictures before the ceremony, so they have to stage a first look moment. So all morning long, I wasn't allowed to see Rachel at all. She was off with her bridesmaids, uh, brushing her teeth and scrubbing her nails, whatever it is that girls do to get ready. Um, She took like five hours to get ready with her bridesmaids. My groomsmen and I were done in 15 minutes. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, around around two o'clock, it was time for the first look. So I was brought outside by the photographer and told to face the, the lake at the venue that we were at. Photographer told me that Rachel was gonna come up behind me, she was gonna tap me on the shoulder, and then I could turn around. And I was super nervous about this. I don't know why, but I was very nervous. And soon I heard uh, footsteps behind me, and then I felt a tap on my shoulder. I paused for a moment, and then I turned around. And it wasn't Rachel. I'm just kidding, that was some Jacob and Leah humor for you. Uh, It was Rachel, and uh, she looked stunning. Uh, Yeah, did I cry? You'll never know. (laughs) Uh, This picture was moments after I turned around. You know, as I think back to the rush of feelings during that first look moment, uh, my mind begins to anticipate another first look moment that you and I will soon get to have. One day, we will get to see Jesus face to face for the very first time. I love the lyrics to the popular song, I Can Only Imagine, which talk about this exact moment. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance 
for you, Jesus? Or in awe, just be still. Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees, will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I'm gonna invite the praise team to come up as I wrap up here. Here's what, here's what I wanna leave you with today. You were made for God. You were made to love him and to be loved by him. That is your highest calling. That is your deepest longing. The the telos of history, the goal of the universe is for Jesus to be reunited with his bride. The end of the world is a wedding. So how then do you prepare for the end of the world. Well, it's not with disaster bunkers filled with canned food. It's not by warring with culture and proclaiming that the end is near. It's not by worrying about whether or not you made the heavenly guest list. You prepare for the end of the world by being a lover of God. See, there's a wedding that will heal the world. And the more that you receive and respond to God's love today, the more you're getting a taste of eternity. So if you haven't before, I want to invite you to experience the joy and the welcome of the Father. You don't have to earn God's love. You can just fall into his open embrace because his arms are where you were made to rest for all of eternity. So again, the words of Jesus, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. The gospel is a powerful true story and like any good book or movie, what matters most is how the story ends. And let me tell you how it ends. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. So if you would stand with me as we sing this song one more time as we close. There is coming a day where no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky. face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land, what a day, glorious day. Come, Lord Jesus, come.
quickly. Uh, We want to see your face and be with you. Amen.